I'm Jerry Garfinkel. I'm the treasurer of the Jewish Study Center, and I welcome all of you to our study center. Um, I'm also the technical director. So let me start with the treasury business. Um, as you know, this class and all of our classes right now are free, but we do have some expenses. So we encourage donations. It is not at all required, but they're very welcome. If you want to donate, go to our website, www.jewishstudycenter.org and click on donate. And you can donate PayPal or with your credit card or by check. If you say you want to donate by check, it'll give you an address on where to send your check. Okay, so that's my treasury uh, duties. As tech director, I'll say that um, everybody is muted and I, I, th I think I should put on the, uh, what do you call it, the, the uh, constant, the closed ca captions. Do you see where that is, Natanya? Where the close, they moved it somewhere. Um, I don't, I don't see it. Um, and we do want people's comments and their questions. So write your comments or questions in the chat box and address it to everyone. Sometimes someone writes a question or a comment, someone else then comments upon that and a little discussion um, starts. I think that's about it. So now I will introduce I can find her. I will introduce um, Mindy Reiser, who will then introduce our esteemed rabbi. Where are you, Mindy? Okay. <clears throat> I'm delighted to welcome you from various parts of our United States. And I suspect we'll find people from outside the United States as well. Let me give you a sense of the very interesting and accomplished person who will be speaking tonight. And that is Lance J. Sussman, who is both a rabbi and a PhD. He began uh, his career um, a while ago and he served as senior rabbi at Reform Congregation Knesset Israel in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. Some of you on this call are from Elkins Park. And he was there from 2001 to 2022. Quite a tumultuous time in these United States. And he then has had uh, a very interesting career in thinking and writing about the intersection of Jewish life and American life. Uh, he's a specialist in American Jewish history and is the author of a number of books in this field, including the biography of Isaac Leeser and the, Ma and the Making of American Judaism. That was in 1995 along with uh, Jonathan Sarna and Paula Nadell, distinguished researchers in Jewish history. He served as an editor of New Essays in American Jewish History. That was in 2010. He is a prolific writer, and he writes in, on, on, on an enormous array of topics, including modern Jewish life and Jewish art. He has recently published Portrait of an American Rabbi. I have it here. It's a fascinating compilation of essays from his experience as a rabbi and his observations about the course of American Jewish history. Um, in addition to his pulpit work, Rabbi Sussman has taught at Princeton, Binghamton University, Hunter College, and also served as chair of the Board of Governors of Gratz College. He has given hundreds of community lectures and participated in a number of TV documentaries. He has been doing some very lighthearted lectures on such things 
as How Lux Became Jewish, A History of American Jewish Delhi. That should interest a number of you. And Walk Softly and Carry a Big Shtick, Teddy Roosevelt and American Jews. He currently serves as the memoirs section editor of the Southern Jewish Historical Society, which some of you may not have known about, and they have a journal which he's involved with. And he is working on a book on Jews, laws, and the American Revolution. He is currently also serving as the vice president of the North American Board of Rabbis, vice president of the Philadelphia Board of Rabbis, and Senior Scholars of Roots and Reform Judaism. He was the founding president of the Cheltenham, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, area, area Multi-Faith Council, and has been involved in museum work in Philadelphia and Binghamton. And now let's have the speaker himself for him to take us forward. But before you start, Lance, let me make a... Another announcement. Uh, this is being recorded, as most of you noticed. And after every, uh, after the recording is posted, I'll send an email to everyone uh, with the uh, recording uh, uh, location. Okay, Lance, go on. Also, also, uh, put in your questions on chat. We're, we're not going to interrupt the rabbi as he speaks, but when he is finished, we'll then look at the questions and pose some of them to him. And then you can disrupt me, and that'll be fine. <laughs> So, um, Mindy and Jerry, thank you so much uh, for the warm introduction and for inviting me uh, in the first place. I was really glad to learn about the Jewish Study Center, and I thank so many of you for spending this part of your evening with me. Um, what I'd like to do with the time we have together is kind of do a quick march through the, the history of the rabbinate and then focus on uh, current circumstances. I, I think it's um, an important topic for us today because we're in an unusual moment in the history um, of of the rabbinate in the sense that um, in the in the non-orthodox world, um, there is a growing shortage of rabbis, and the definition of rabbinic function is changing very, very rapidly, um, as is just about everything in Jewish life at this point, changing very, very rapidly. And on the other side of the coin, um, I wouldn't call it an abundance of rabbis, but there is an unprecedented number of um, Orthodox rabbis. Uh, I, I don't know how you could statistically prove it, but there may be more Orthodox rabbis today then at any time before in all of Jewish history, there are a number of very, very large rabbinic school issue vote in the Orthodox world that are both producing um, ordained rabbis as well as particularly on the far right of the Mitnagdic world, the yeshiva world, um, people who do the whole course of rabbinic studies but don't take any form of of ordination. So, you know, on the one side, we are we're entering into what might almost be called a crisis in the history of the rabbinate. And on the other side, there is a full flowering of rabbinic learning and, um, and traditional uh, Jewish scholarship. Um, so what, what got us to this point? Um, and I want to go back to um, the beginning of the rabbinic movement. I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. If we had 14 weeks in a regular semester, we could do it in a less rush fashion and, and more carefully and more deeply. But I want to at least give you some headlines um, with respect to the somewhat surprising history of the rabbinate, if you're not aware of the history of, of the rabbinate. Uh, it's not what one might um, expect. Um, the rabbinic movement um, is generally viewed in, in critical study, and there's a world of difference, and we might be talking about this in, in the Q&A, um, between traditional Jewish study, traditional Jewish narrative, and the critical approach 
to the study of um, the Jewish past. They they are very very different in how they tell the Jewish story. They are very very different in what they use basically as um, evidence. Um, the rabbinic movement, from the critical point of view, uh, is probably a step after the Pharisaic movement emerging sometime in the first century. But if you look at it from a traditional point of view, it's part of what's called Shalshalat HaKabalah, the chain of tradition that stretches all the way back to Moses and the, and the prophets as, as articulated in uh, Pirkei Avot. And many of you, I'm sure, are, are familiar with that, um, with that passage. Um, there are all types of titles in Hebrew uh, for rabbi. Uh, there's Rav, Rabban, Rabbi, Rabbi, Moreno. Um, in some places, at some times, th these titles can be organized uh, into a hierarchy. There, that is, there are more and less um, learned rabbis. And other times, they, it's simply um, honorific. Uh, and rabbi or, re or rebbe or different terms uh, was simply Mr. This long before Sally Prezant comes along in, in 1972. Um, essentially, with the emergence of a rabbinic movement in the first century, it, it has to do with people who are developing and mastering what's called the oral tradition of Torah. The, the early rabbis have uh, their own viewpoint about Torah, and that it's not just the Torah that's given to Moses on Mount Sinai that's called Torah Dichtiv, but there is an oral interpretation of Torah that's Torah Shabbat Peh. And it's assumed that you would know the written Torah, but what's special about the rabbis or the rabbans or whatever title you want, want to use uh, is that they are masters of this oral tradition, which um, ultimately will come to be written itself uh, in in the Talmud and Midrash and other uh, and other uh, classic works written by the la the rabbis of um, antiquity. Um, it's it's not clear when the rabbinic movement actually begins in Judaism. Sometime in the first century, certainly by the end of the first century, it's there. Um, the relationship between rabbi and synagogue, likewise, is very unclear. And how do the two come together is an interesting and debated story. Um, I like to point out that in the Talmud, uh, there's a discussion that, uh, by the rabbis how inappropriate it is to have plaques in synagogues for donations. And as you can tell, nobody listened, and there are plaques in synagogues for um, uh, for uh, donations. And, and even more curious, um, many of you have been to uh, second, third century synagogues in Israel, and the floors have the zodiac on them. And the rabbis write against that, and the people continue to to uh, do it. The the Hebrew term for constellation is mazal. And to show you how strong the resistance of the people to the rabbis have been at different times, it's still normal in Jewish life uh, to say congratulations. You say mazal tov, which means may you have a good astrological sign. Uh, so there are the, these tensions that have existed um, all along. Uh, again, in the conventional view, uh, it was it was believed that by the beginning of the third century with the um, with the, the Mishnah, the, the first layer of the Talmud, that the rabbis were pretty much in control of the um, community, although that's not clear either. Certainly the Mishnah represents some kind of relationship that's developing between rabbinic uh, legal authorities and the legal authorities of the um, of the Roman uh, of the Roman Empire um, but it's it's still not clear as to whether or not the the rabbis are the sole or principal 
religious leaders in the community and how they relate to the non-rabbinic leaders in the community. Um, we know that smicha, or ordination, was actually suspended by the church in the 5th century. There was an attempt to reinstate smicha uh, in, Tza, in Tzvat in Israel in the 16th century, but that was very, very um, controversial. One, one theory um, that is getting played today is that um, rabbinic authority um, was really achieved or at least uh, amplified with the establishment of uh, Islam in Mesopotamia. And the Islamic authorities viewed the rabbis as the parallel to the imams and gave them um, new power. Um, and that maybe it's really not until that point, late, a couple centuries late in the history of uh, the rabbinic movement, that the rabbis are viewed as the leading religious authorities in the um, Jewish community. Once established in the world of Islam, which of course had a much larger Jewish population and a bigger geographic range than Jews in um, Christianity, there was a, an immense rebellion uh, against the rabbis, beginning in what, what today would be Iraq, led by Anand ben David, who launches the Karite movement. Uh, and they basically say, look, the rabbis are just making stuff up. Uh, if it's not in the, in the Bible, if it's not in the Torah, it's not Judaism. And the, the rabbis are just making stuff up. A big fight occurred over how to compute the Jewish calendar, and it takes a couple centuries until the rabbis get control, let's say about the year 1000, in Islamic lands over um, the Karaites. And then there's a whole long story about what happens to the Karaites afterwards, which is, um, uh, which is a very interesting story. Um, for the most part, throughout the Middle Ages, the title rabbi is not really used that much in the uh, Jewish community. Certainly in Sephardic Jews, use hacham. And what they were avoiding basically was the issue of ordination since it had been suspended and then once um, and then once, and then were attempts to reinstate it which which did not go very smoothly it's also true that until the high middle ages uh, rabbis were not compensated for their work uh, the basic thinking was um, rabbis are essentially doing mitzvot or a specific set of mitzvot you can't be paid to do a mitzvah so what would be the basis for um, compensation and what they came up with was really Talmudic thinking to say the least that if you are doing mitzvot full time on behalf of the community then you don't have time for a real job so that the community had to pay the rabbi for the work that the rabbi was not doing uh, so and then the debate broke out well what's the work that the rabbi is not doing and i'll use modern terms so the rabbi said well look we're we're brain surgeons and you should be paying us uh, for brain surgery and the town people were saying well well maybe you're removing garbage on thursday afternoon and you should be paid paid for that so the, the question of rabbinic compensation became a real hot potato beginning and around the 14th century um the rabbinate that we have today uh is really very much post-medieval. It is not a, a consistent profession uh, with consistent training or consistent or consistent function. Uh, really, until the 19th century, with immense changes beginning to take place in the uh, 18th century. And, and let me give you uh, just a few of the things. Remember, the rabbinate up to this point was mostly um, teaching and and handling legal matters in the in the Jewish um, in the Jewish community, the, the the Jewish community itself was organized not by synagogues, but by communities by the kihilot, and the kihilot had boards, and the boards were not necessarily made up of rabbis. Um, there is a change by the end by the fifth end of the fifteenth century with printing. Because and we're going through something like that again, maybe even more 
with digital access to sources, where there's this democratization of of um, of Jewish um, Jewish learning. In in the 18th century, um, you get a split in East Europe between the Hasi the developing Hasidic movement and what had been the established Talmudic learning community who became known as the opposition to the to the um to the Hasidim and they became known as the Mitnagdim or the Misnagdim depending on your uh dialect of of Hebrew the Hasidic ra rabbis rabbis tzaddikim uh established courts that are dynastic following the pattern of the the monarchy in ancient Israel with the belief that ultimately the Messiah will come from the line of uh of, of King David and the Mitnagdim was based on um, meritorious um, study of the uh, of the of the of the Talmud. Uh, so you get this split uh, in the largest Jewish population center as to what constitutes uh, an authoritative Jewish leader. Is it going to be a Talmud scholar, or is it going to be a dynastic? Hasidic rabbi who may be charismatic or claim to have healing powers or something along uh, those lines. Also in the 18th century, you get um, the rise of the modern canterate. Uh, rabbis historically did not lead services. That is a strictly modern function of uh, the rabbi. Um, the first real professionalization of um, service leaders, uh, shatzim as they're called in Hebrew, or shlichei tzibor, um, or the canners, the chazanim, and that represents a, a, a synthesis of traditional Jewish music with the growing world of opera, um, bel canto music in, um, in, in Europe. So you begin to get that specialization in the area of, uh, of Jewish music. The rabbi as service leader is going to take at least another uh, 100, 100 years. Um, you get in the 18th century a new class of Jewish scholars who are called maskilim, who are products of the Jewish Enlightenment, very often anti-clerical themselves. Uh, much of this movement um, believed in Hebrew scholarship, although there's also Jewish Enlightenment movements in the Yiddish language and even in in German and, and Russian, but the main thrust of it was Hebraic with the belief that you could have an enlightened modern scholar proficient in Hebrew who had no real connection to religion, um, religion per se. And then that is going to be overturned by the beginning of the 19th century. And this is really the critical mutation um, with the, the rise of um, Jewish studies, modern Jewish studies first in, in Germany. You also begin to get new political structures that will strengthen the traditional side of the, uh, of the, the rabbinate. So for example, as, as early as 1758, following the pattern of the Church of England, you get the chief rabbi of England, the chief rabbi of the, of the British empire which creates this governmental kind of structure and that becomes the origin of the double chief rabbinate of of israel it becomes the uh, model that will be followed in the ottoman empire with the hahambashi and the the rabbi the leading rabbi of istanbul and the ottoman empire so you get this kind of governmental um stamp of approval uh, somewhat reflective of what had happened early in Islam in, let's say, by the 8th, 8th century before challenged by the, uh, uh, by the Karaites in Jewish life. In my opinion, the, the critical mutation that takes place uh, in the modern rabbinate uh, is the rise of uh, what we would call Jewish studies in the United States. Uh, it, it mostly takes place in Germany. In German, it's called Wissenschaft des Judentums, the scientific study of Judaism. It was prohibited in German universities, so Wissenschaftler scholars worked outside of the university system. They started creating their own um, their own journals of scientific um, research, um, 
And in time, by 1829, we get the first modern rabbinic seminary, different from the yeshiva and traditional ta Talmudic study, but using this Wissenschaftlich critical method uh, to train rabbis in the sources of, of Judaism. And interestingly, the first one is in, in Padua in Italy, and then there's one in, in Metz in France, and then very significantly um, several in, in Germany, beginning with the, the original Jewish Theological Seminary in uh, Breslau. Uh, Berlin gets the Hochschule, which is the Reform Seminary there. And then here in the United States, you get uh, the Hebrew Union College in, in Cincinnati, in which they do not use traditional Talmudic study to prepare rabbis, but they use university-based learning to, to train rabbis, albeit in a period in which Jewish studies is not permitted in universities because of anti-Semitism. Anti-Semitism in universities is, is nothing new. It's a big problem, very controversial right now. Uh, but from the beginning of universities, there were issues with the place of Jews and the study of Judaism and the university uh, in the university um, system. Uh, it's really not until the, the 60s that you begin to have uh, the normalization of Jewish studies in the American and, and European um, university systems leaving the seminaries kind of off on the increasingly marginalized on the side as being the main centers of Jewish scholarship in the non-Orthodox in the non-Orthodox um, world. Rabbis were trained in Wissenschaftlich methods and not according to the Baal, the, the, the Torah of uh, of uh, the oral Torah Shabal Peh. Um, the situation specifically here uh, in the United States is the United States and the colonies before that uh, are separated by a big pond from Europe. And until the time of the Civil War, uh, the Jewish community here was relatively small, thereafter grows quite rapidly, and for a while is the largest Jewish community in the world and in Jewish history, but it is an outpost of, of Jewish life. Um, and it is not an attractive place for rabbis to come. You have Jewish settlement in North America, um, permanent settlement by 1654, but you do not have a rabbi moving here permanently until the 1840s. It was a rabbi, Abraham Rice. And for any of you who have seen the movie Frisco Kid with Gene Wilder, it's, it's not that far off. Um, Wilder plays a rabbi who was, who was kind of the guy they wanted to get rid of in, in Europe. And, and that's the uh, not far from the truth. Uh, it seems that the Bavarian Rabbinic Council wanted to get rid of one Abraham Rice, and they sent him to America. He's the first rabbi with proper credentials uh, to, to settle here as a graduate of a, of a, at least trained in a yeshiva, but a difficult personality. And within a few years, uh, he was studying the Talmud in the back of his his wife's store. He refused to officiate at a Masonic uh, funeral, and he was uh, he was dismissed. But after that, you begin to get rabbis who have training. You also get rabbis who begin to come here who are known as rabbi doctors, and uh, these are rabbis. And, and I, I'm a kind of rabbi doctor. Um, these are rabbis who went to yeshiva and then went to a university, usually a German university, and obtained a, a PhD in, let's say, philosophy, and they became known as rabbi doctors. They were not well received in the traditional community that had a saying that when rabbis became doctors, Judaism became sick. And they rejected that kind of, of rabbinic um, education. I think it's the other way around. I think in modernity, Judaism became sick and rabbis became uh, doctors. It was in the non-rabbinic area of Jewish religious leadership in, in America that you get the formulation or crystallization of what is going to be the modern rabbi, particularly the modern rabbi in the United States, which in time is going to be the largest Jewish uh, community, and that's, you heard about my book on uh, Isaac Leeser, 
Lezer was not a rabbi. Uh, he was an immigrant who had a solid Jewish education. Um, he was called upon by a, the synagogue, the Sephardic synagogue in uh, Philadelphia to function as their primary religious uh, leader. He never called himself rabbi. He assumed he had no halachic halafic authority, but he went about the business of creating, in my opinion, a, a modern orthodoxy, uh, which made Jewish sources available in English, uh, emphasized the, the need for decorum, actually believed that the Sephardic tradition, not Ashkenazic, should provide the basis for prayer in the Jewish community, and quite uh, quite importantly, introduced preaching to the American synagogue. And the sermon at that point uh, became the mainstay of what was emerging as a uniquely modern and um, American-style uh, rabbinate. The, the origin of the sermon itself is very, very interesting to me. Um, Leeser himself did not want to preach but he was, a pre he was approached by the leading uh, woman in his congregation, one Rebecca Gratz, uh, was a member of Mikveh Israel, who explained to him that the women of the congregation received no formal Jewish education and that they needed to have a Jewish education. And couldn't he give Shabbat discourses? Well, the men in the congregation felt that a three-hour service was long enough, and they really didn't need somebody preaching at them in addition to the uh, three hours. But Rebecca was persistent, and they cut a deal. They had a compromise so that Leeser began to preach uh, after Adon Alum, after the service was over. And apparently the men went home for lunch, and the women stayed up in the balcony and listened to uh, Leeser preach. Uh, by, by the end of his career, he published 10 500-page books uh, that represented his, his uh, anthology of his sermons, which he viewed as his greatest um, accomplishment. Uh, I went through them for my master's degree. Uh, I read all 500 I read, I read all 10 books, all 5,000 pages. I indexed them by theme, et cetera. And I can tell you definitively and authoritatively, there wasn't one good sermon in the whole lot. They were absolutely boring and typical of a German immigrant. They had super long sentences. I was so bored. I started quantifying the number of words per sentence. He would get up to 250 words. He was addicted to semicolons and things like that. It was straight uh, biblical exegesis. Later, I learned how to decode them and how he might talk about uh, uh, the suffering of the innocent. And then I could correlate that to, let's say, the report of a massive um, earthquake somewhere where a lot of people died in the earthquake, and how could a good God let that happen? But he rarely let the reader know it, the audience, the congregation probably, uh, the congregation probably knew it um, at the time. In the American colonies, um, the most recent person off the boat who had some Hebrew skills served uh, as the prayer leader in the, in the colonial synagogue, and that goes all the way up to 1840. On occasion, there was a very competent person such as Gershon Satius from uh, New York, also in uh, Philadelphia, but but by and large, the the uh, boards controlled the, the kihilot with a firm hand. And interestingly, because they were Sephardic, they used either Spanish or Portuguese term um, to identify themselves, and, and quite aptly, they called themselves juntas. And the relationship between these early Chazanim sort of proto-rabbis, and the juntas was was very, very bad, uh, and Leeser uh, collided with his and had terrible problems before branching out on his own. One Isaac Mayer Wise comes along in the 1840s, and he has he's a visionary who wants to create a respected and uh, a respected uh, religiously authoritative rabbinate, a modern rabbinate, 
trained uh, the way they were training rabbis in the new rabbinic schools in um, in in Europe in the Wissenschaft uh, style, and who was capable of giving uh, a good and well informed sermon. And he's already agitating for that in the 1850s uh, with his failed Zion College. Leiser himself creates a rabbinic school in 1866, but it's uh, short lived. As best I can tell, in post-Civil War America, the title rabbi is almost never used. Remember, there's it's uncertain as to the title rabbi in the first century, and then there's a suspension, suspension of ordination. There's all these reasons that would mitigate the use of the term rabbi. In the second half of the 19th century, with a growing Jewish community, what you find are terms like reverend, doctor, and minister, and not just in reform, all the way across uh, a board or the board. So even today, a little less today than let's say even 20 years ago, if you have a Moel who's doing circumcision, but he's not ordained, he still might use the term reverend or, or uh, minister. If a, if a rabbi, a functioning rabbi had a PhD, um, they would tend to call themselves doctor uh, and not rabbi. The earliest so-called rabbinic organizations in the United States, whether it was New York or Philadelphia, called themselves the boards of Jewish ministers. And my, my hunch is uh, the term rabbi started to be used uh, outside the Jewish community, mostly in the South, with other people referring to the religious leader of the synagogue as rabbi, and then it began to spread. I haven't written that up yet, but I've been collecting notes, and my hunch that is how the term rabbi became standardized in, in English for Jewish religious um, Jewish religious leadership. You get your first um, permanent seminary for rabbis, modern, in 1875 in Cincinnati, and then a professional organization of alumni in 1889, the CCAR. And by and large, um, the... Um, the schools become aligned with denominations. Very few of them were actually set up um, that way so that the, the rabbis are trained according to a denominational standards. By the beginning of the 20th century, the Nagdic movement, that is the anti-Hasidic yeshiva movement, um, begins to um, sink roots here in the United States. Uh, you get a place like Chaim Berlin, which is in Brooklyn in 1904, which is a vast institution with hundreds, if not thousands of students who rarely take ordination. And there, Israel and Baltimore, which is a right-wing yeshiva, and the biggest of all in Lakewood, New Jersey, uh, which is a, a complex of, of different uh, Batei Midrashim um, that has as many as 6,000 rabbinic students. Right now, places like HUC and JTS are, stu are struggling to get 12 students in a class, and these yeshivas have hundreds, and in some cases, thousands of students who are truly conversant in, in Talmud. Um, there also are attempts at pan-denominational schools, uh, like uh, JIR in New York in 1922, and in the, uh, in the American arena in particular, uh, I would say sometime uh, around 1910, 1912, uh, under the influence of uh, the social gospel movement, maybe the Wilson presidential campaign, uh, rabbis begin to see themselves as spokesmen for um, civil, civil rights issues and, and economic issues in the United States. And begin to make the claim that they are the inheritors of the prophets of uh, ancient Israel, and you begin to get the use of the term prophetic um, Judaism. A very important development in the history of the American rabbinate uh, was World War I, uh, World War II, even more than World War I. Uh, over half a million Jews um, serve in the armed forces of the United States. There's a large supply of rabbinic chaplains, there's a standard prayer book. Uh, services are led by military chaplains. My guess is the uh, Army issue prayer book uh, of World War II was the most printed prayer book in the history of the Jewish people. 
Uh, and this came at a time when most American Jews were either East European born or the descendants of East European Jews, and were moving very, very far away from, uh, from, from organized Judaism themselves. And it sets up a flowering of, of suburban synagogues with modern trained rabbis in the period immediately after um, World War II, where you get another dimension is introduced. Joshua Loth Liebman writes a best-selling book, maybe the best-selling book ever written by a rabbi called Peace of Mind in 1946, and that brings in the dimension of pastoral counseling using modern psychological and even psychiatric um, methodologies. On the other hand, you have this huge expansion of the rabbinate. In addition to preaching now, you have social action and you have, you have counseling that comes into the picture. The synagogues are in competition with the federations who are representing the, mostly the needs of the emerging Jewish state in Israel. Uh, my professor said about the 1950s, that the Federation movement emerges as the heavy industry of American Jews and the synagogue and the rabbinate as the light, um, the light industry of American Jews. The rabbis are further weak, and there are several studies on this, again, for competition in the community, not only in the Federation world, but also in the synagogue world as to who was really in charge, who was really in charge. Early on, before World War I, the early federations and synagogues were mostly controlled by people in business. After World War II, it's increasingly by professionals and specifically by lawyers. And there's this real clash in terms of who has power in the Jewish uh, community. And ultimately, the, the lawyers, according to most of the arguments, went out because of the authority of the American Constitution as opposed to the authority of the Torah, where the, what the rabbis are supposed to uh, represent. Another mutation comes in, in 67 with the Six-Day War, um, and how Jews on the left in particular handled the, the left's turn against Israel and, and Zionism, and a break off in kind of its own Jewish left, folk culture, counterculture Judaism, that I like to call Woodstock Judaism, it has some nice developments like the return of the ketubah as folk art, the Jewish catalogs, and it's all that world of kind of zap comic books. Um, late growing out of civil rights and Vietnam uh, is a, a delayed impact of feminism on the, the rabbinate. And you have Sally Prezan, of course, being ordained in 72. There are some prior women, but it's consistent institutionally after that. You get the rise of uh, Kabbalistic studies, um, first in the academy itself because of an Israeli, German Israeli scholar named Gershom, um, uh, Gershom Shalom, uh, but then uh, it goes into counter uh, counterculture, uh, a vast expansion of Jewish PhDs, Jewish studies PhDs that replace the rabbinic class, including the rabbi doctor, as the principal scholars in the uh, in the uh, Jewish community. By the end of the 20th century, with the exception of the Orthodox sector, it's pretty well agreed that American Judaism is entering into a, a kind of malaise. Um, the um, conservative movement is a little more upfront about admitting its problems, a little harder to disguise. Reform holds on a little bit longer. Reconstruction institutionally doesn't fully um, take off, and but now everybody's kind of in the same boat. And at the same time that you have a decline developing in the non-Orthodox world in the last quarter of the 20th century, Orthodoxy, because of fertility, retention, what's known as the BT movement, the Bali Teshuva movement, uh, is very much on, uh, very much on on the rise. The last mutation, I think, that's really important in understanding, uh, particularly the non-Orthodox, really both, both sides of the equation today, uh, is, the, is the rise of computer technology. And this meeting is a perfect example of it. Um, by the 70s, we're beginning to get personal computers. When I started my PhD in the 1980s, I did not own a computer. By the time I was writing my thesis, I had an Apple IIe with floppy disks. 
that somehow I lost my first three chapters because I couldn't find the disc and it was horrifying. Uh, but obviously that technology has developed exponentially. And then with COVID, you had this acceleration of the use of technology in synagogue uh, programming and particularly penetrating into the older population, which had been quite uh, resistant to using technology for Jewish life, but they couldn't get out because of COVID. And you begin to get things like Zoom. We, some of us were debating Zoom weddings and things like that uh, before this, this, lecture, this uh, lesson actually started. Uh, I know that particularly uh, in the second, in the last quarter of the 20th century and the rise of technology and the various things that are weakening um, the rabbinate, that there is a decline in intellectualism from the, from the pulpit. Whereas back in the 60s, you still had a number of rabbi doctors who were giving longer sermons that were based, often based on their own original um, research that sermons were beginning to move more into short entertainment section, sessions than they were any kind of serious statement about Jewish scholarship. If you want Jewish scholarship, you go to a conference or you pick up a, a scholarly, uh, a scholarly, um, news, uh, scholarly uh, German uh, journal. Um, one or two more things, and then I would want to open it up. I don't know how we're doing on the chat part. Um, a phenomena in American Jewish life and world Jewish life that is changing the synagogue and changing the rabbinate that needs to be recognized as the Lubavitch movement, uh, which is a face on the Hasidic movement. Uh, it is challenging for sure the business model of the American synagogue, which had been based on a, a membership, uh, a plan, business, business plan that basically calls for membership whereas the Lubavitch model is based on philanthropy and anybody can join without a standardized uh, dues. And lit literally a, a rabbi and a rabbitson who have no boundaries with respect to their work, their entire life is all about um, promoting uh, Lubavitch uh, Judaism, which is a direct challenge to the, what had occurred in terms of the professionalization of the rabbinate, beginning with Isaac Mayer Wise and HUC in Cincinnati in um, 1875. And then lastly, and very controversially, um, we know that women have been ordained consistently since 1972. Uh, I believe that about 90% of the new ordinees of canners are women. And there is uh, almost parity now between male and uh, female rabbis. Uh, we know there are, there are salary discrepancy, and there's also a big challenge that has happened in other, other fields that as women move into a field, let's say teaching or secretary uh, or whole new fields like nursing in the 19th century, that men begin to move out of it. Well, certainly it's not true in orthodoxy, although there is now a movement of orthodox uh, women who, who go and have orthodox training, but they're generally not recognized by the main bodies of orthodoxy. And whether or not the, these politics of, of gender are pushing men, or not pushing men out, but whether men are declining to go into it because it doesn't meet the criteria of uh, male careerism, or even on whether or not uh, the new kind of rabbinic student is interested in a professional career as opposed to a, a, a spiritual journey. So in sum, here we are at the beginning of the 21st century. Um, the modern rabbinate is a completely transformed uh, vocation from how it had been in the Middle Ages. Uh, it has lines of development that are new and unprecedented. We don't know where they're going to go ultimately. And institutionally, we're trying to catch up and figure out how do you attract young people into the rabbinate and what exactly will they do in the rabbinate and who's going to pay them? What will the institutional bodies look like? We're, we're in a whole new day. I don't, I don't have the answer to any of it. Um, I could imagine, however, the synagogue of the future having a Jewish tattoo parlor and uh, it, maybe it'll attract more 
young people. Some of my own kids have tattoos. I was aghast, and my wife uh, wisely said to me, pick your battles. And so I'm quiet. So with that, I want to stop. And uh, I think we went pretty long here and uh, would love to hear questions and, and nice comments. <laughs> okay. Well, Rabbi, you have shared so much over so many centuries that, uh, again, one could spend the next couple of months uh, digging deeper and deeper into this. One of the issues, uh, you've talked about the international spread of the rabbinate and scholarship and change. What are the tendencies outside of the United States in terms of the rabbinate? I know your focus is on American Jewish history, but I think there is interest in seeing how this plays out globally. People, please write questions in the chat. So um, I think the you know, dividing the field in half between Orthodox and non-Orthodox, the Orthodox situation, I think, is pretty consistent globally, that there's a rise in the numbers of people studying to be rabbis or almost rabbis stopping short of actual ordination and gaining uh, rather remarkable proficiency in um, rabbinic texts. I know many of the tools available have improved vastly since I first started in the 1970s. Couldn't read a word of Aramaic, and today there are many guides to how to read um, Aramaic. I think the rise of a uh, larger population of Hebrew, native Hebrew speakers have helped this um, immensely. Um, when you have to break it down by country or region. Uh, there seems to be growing interest in South America. There's a new reform um, rabbinic school in Sao Paulo now that has emerged, uh, and it's not just relying on the European centers. Um, in Argentina, there's a conservative that had been traditionally a rather left, left-wing left leaning seminary, the way the right Reconstructionist is. But they're not, they don't have large numbers of students. And for the most part, non-Orthodox Judaism is relatively weak um, outside of the United States. So those numbers are, are relatively small because the, the size of the reform movement and the conservative movement outside the United States is relatively small. Conservative has been doing a little better than reform in Israel. But again, the numbers remain small, and it's taking time for there to be uh, a Sabra-based um, basis to the rabbinate in, in Israel itself, which would be critical for the world, uh, the whole diaspora as well in terms of the rabbinate. Okay, I'm having a little bit of trouble with my Zoom, but let me ask about the interfaith movement, which certainly has been quite popular in many places, how is that affecting the rabbinate and interest of people in joining the rabbinate? Well, one immediate question that has come up in, in recent decades is something that was unthinkable, you know, early in my career. Um, could one be a rabbinic student and have a non-Jewish spouse? And this, you know, the HUC said no, J, uh, JTS said no, I believe uh, Reconstructionists left it open. Outside the United States, they tend to be more traditional than inside of the, of the, uh, of the United States. Uh, I remember seeing a pamphlet probably in the late uh, 80s written by a, a, a Seltzer, Sanford Seltzer in the Boston area that was called The Role of the Non-Jew in the Synagogue. And I, I went, what's that? Uh, and today it's totally normal. Um, the conservative movement is wrestling with exactly how to integrate, and the rabbis have to adjust accordingly. Um, the good part about it is uh, I think it has muted uh, what I would call anti-Goyism. I heard a lot of Goy jokes growing up, but at this point with 
mixed marriage being statistically normal in the Jewish community. You're going to insult your relatives if you're going to tell anti-goy jokes, and the cultural difference between Jews and non-Jews is greatly diminished. So from the, the rabbi has become the welcomer of the non-Jew in the synagogue. And for many synagogues, it's a big part of the rabbinic uh, job description, whether it's explicit or implicit, as to whether or not they can work with the non-Jewish uh, population and whether they can do that with uh, fullness of heart or they're doing it because they have to, have to do it. And for many communities, this is absolutely essential in terms of the well-being of the, co of the congregation. Okay, there, there have been some questions about some pragmatic issues in terms of rabbi PhDs and where they are going and their number, which as you said, has diminished, but they're still around. So some synagogues may have them, some universities may recruit them. Where is this world going? It's, it's diminishing, uh, especially uh, where I fit in the picture. I realize I'm a dinosaur myself. Um, the rabbi doctor, uh, as congregational leader, is really a thing of the past. Uh, it, it used to be big pulpit, Emmanuel in New York. You needed some kind of doctorate. The seminaries invented in absentia degrees in order to get the doctorate. Sometimes it was because they didn't have accreditation yet on a full PhD, so they came up with um, the DHL programs. And of course, they gave, uh, they continue to give what are called doctorates of duration, the DD, that if you survive 25 years without felony charges in the rabbinate, that you get your DD. Uh, I have to tell you, when I received my DD, uh, initially I agreed to accept it uh, because I felt, well, you know, I did 25 years, I should collect it. And then I found it to be tremendously meaningful as a ceremony to have that kind of um, recognition, but I don't think the rabbis use them uh, anymore as a way of authenticating themselves. Uh, and to, to that point, I have to say, because I, I have had a two-track career and I've spent a lot of time teaching in universities, I, I had to make decisions about how I would identify myself in the university setting. I didn't want to go with straight professor because it didn't tell the whole story. And I was reluctant to say rabbi because I didn't want to chase away non-Jewish students. So I said doctor. So I would write up, you know, on the board, Dr. Sussman will be teaching her class today. And in 100% of the situations that I found myself in, the students all called me rabbi. At Rutgers once, I even had a student came up to come up to me after class and said he wanted to know if I was embarrassed to be a rabbi because I didn't lead with that title. And at that point, I went, this is ridiculous. I'm just going to identify myself as rabbi. And there's good news in that, by the way. There's this perception, and it squares with my thesis that the term rabbi is introduced into American English from the South, that it is still used as a term of, of respect. Maybe not in every board meeting, but in the general society, I think it still does act as a, as a term of, of uh, real, real respect and an assumption of some genuine learning. And hopefully that's still, still true. They're not the same. They're not trained the same way as PhDs in terms of research or theory, but nevertheless have some significant uh, learning behind their, behind their title. Okay, you've alluded to this some, but let me ask straight on. What is the future of the Jewish Theological Seminary and Hebrew Union College? Um, will they struggle on? Will they somehow merge? I mean, these are venerable institutions and have had a, a great impact in Jewish life, but they are not thriving. What is the next 10 or 20 years? Well, there's a saying that, you know, prophecy was given to fools. <laughs> Judaism terminated prophecy around the year 400 BCE. I won't give you the whole quote because it's too nasty, but it's um, if you want to, if you actually want the quote, prophecy was given to fools and women, but we're going to have to do some serious editing uh, on that one. And um, uh, don't know where it's going to go, but hopefully 
the, the narrative I gave you on the history of the rabbinate would suggest that the rabbinate is capable of very radical mutations. And, and maybe we're due for a redefinition of what it means to be a rabbi. Um, and there's some indications, they you tend to use the word disruptor, disruptions today. Maybe, maybe there is a new form that is going to emerge. You know, if you turn the clock back in America uh, 120 years, um, the largest Jewish organizations were the unions, were Jewish unions. And the synagogues were relatively small. The first survey of Jewish education by the Board of Jewish Education in New York City in 1910 um, produced the result that about 10% of Jewish kids were getting a Jewish education in New York City prior to World War I. And then all types of things happened. And after World War II, the numbers were very, very high as to the number of people involved because of the Cold War, because of suburbanization. And it's likely, in my opinion, that the rising generation is going to have to create its own kind of Judaism. I, I think Judaism has proven durable, obviously, over many centuries, has taken on many different uh, forms and institutional expressions, and maybe we're due. Uh, it, it's not, I don't understand my own kids, so how am I supposed to figure out institutional configurations for them? When they're when they're sixty years old, or we're that they're seventy years old, so maybe we're on the cusp of a change. It might include some loss of numbers, but loss of numbers does not mean extinguished in Judaism at all. Our numbers have gotten very small at various times in the past <coughs> to keep coming back. That's the teaching of Isaiah. You cut down the tree, and a little twig grows out of the stump, and before you know it, you have a tree again. So I, I'm going to count on the rising generations to invent something that will work for them. I think what we can do is leave them the tools to do it in the forms of uh, endowments and um, either libraries or technological banks of information where they can access the uh, access the tradition. Okay, let me ask one more question and then turn to Jerry because I have absolutely lost my chat and I can't see anything, but luckily you can hear me. I can see one on the chat I'd like to go to after okay, this. Okay, wh why don't you do that? Oh, okay, so it's from David and thank you for it. It's about modern biblical scholarship in the 20th century and the evolution of rabbis. Um, I, let's turn the clock back to about 1900. Uh, Isaac Merwise at HUC uh, was basically on his deathbed, and he taught that uh, the JEDP theory, the critical documentary theory, would never be taught at HUC, um, that at least the Ten Commandments were given by God to, to Moses, uh, and that we're not going to reduce the Torah to, to literature. Well, and within a few years of his death, a JEDP and the documentary hypothesis were being was being taught there. The conservative movement was re more resistant to it, and it wasn't until rather recently when uh, the conservative movement, together with the with JPS, put out their Eitz Chaim commentary to the Bible that combines modern biblical scholarship with midrash and. And Talmud and one of the Walpies got into a real tangle out in California about this because he said from his pulpit, you know, following the new commentary, it's pretty clear that there was never an exodus from Egypt. It just doesn't align with the data that we have from the 13th century BCE and that the exodus story is a narrative that's developed later in the monarchial uh, period. Uh, and it, it was very stormy, to say the least. I, I'm pretty sure it made the front page of the New York Times, if not the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal. The other place where you, you find that is in uh, archaeology uh, in Israel. If you go back to the founding generation of the state, the, the belief was, Yigal Yadin and others, that you, you take your Bible and you walk out and you use your Bible as your guide, and uh, what's in the ground is going to prove the veracity and the historicity 
of the biblical report. Today, the leading archaeologist in, in Israel, Israel Finkelstein, in his book, Digging Up the Bible, begins with the sentence, uh, if you want to know about ancient Israel's history and material culture, the first thing you do is leave your Bible at home and go with material evidence. And it comes up with, you come up with a completely different story, except maybe Kashrut, because Israelite villages don't have pig bones in their, uh, in their garbage dumps. Um, and there is significant tension uh, between um, official state archaeology and tourism in Israel and the archaeological community. And it's a giant mess mix, mixed up with the politics of Israel and greater Israel and things of that uh, nature. I would say uh, in, in our own time, uh, biblical study has become much less interesting in the Jewish community in general, and rabbinic study has become more interesting, uh, depending where you are on the spectrum in Judaism. If it's Reform, it may be Midrash, Conservative Gemara, if Orthodox Shulchan Aruch, but the, the, it's shifted to the rabbinic texts, and it begs the, quest, the questions about the historicity of the uh, biblical report and the biblical report and how it's understood today is all tied up with the politics of Israel and Zionism. Okay, are there more Zoom questions, uh, Rabbi Sussman, that you'd like to address? Uh, anything from chat that you see? Because I can't see it. Well, Bernard tells us that correctly, it's Sheriff Israel in New York, the original Sephardi synagogue colonial, they still use the term minister, the title minister. Um, and then uh, another comment, why the shortage of rabbis given admission of women? Because the total number is down. It's not like the women compensated for dropping numbers among men. The numbers dropped significantly and not enough women have applied um, to make up for the whole pool. The, the, the general field has become less attractive. Some of the non-denominational schools, particularly Boston Hebrew, have better records right now in attracting students. And in part, that's because the students are not looking for big box careers. They're on a spiritual journey as opposed to developing a professional track for themselves. The other thing, the question I did want to ask as a graduate of Hebrew day schools, um, two of them, ele elementary and, and high school, that certainly was an important force in my life. Do you have any sense about where the Hebrew day schools are going in terms of educators, in terms of their proliferation, people choosing careers as educators in Hebrew day schools? Well, in the again, you always have two sides of the coin. In in the Orthodox world, a rabbi traditionally is a teacher, and that's where these thousands of Orthodox rabbis are going in large numbers as teachers inside of their own system. It's not great for the economy of those systems because you need money from the outside to to make the systems work in Israel. That's why government is so important. Um, in, in that regard, uh, the numbers are not that big in uh, outside of the um, Orthodox world. The Orthodox world, they're very big. And if you, you, you look how it works, it's exponential in the terms of a person comes to America after World War II, has 10 kids, they have 10 kids, they have 10 kids, they have 10 kids. I remember reading an obit of an Orthodox rabbi um, a found, one of the founders, I think, of Muncie, he had over 700 great-grandchildren. <laughs> and their retention rate was better than the Amish, because if you use the same thinking with the Amish, the, all of the United States should be ride, riding around in buggies at this point. But obviously, we're not, and, and they lose people. So the question there is going to be retention over on a longitudinal basis. Um, when the day school movement began in the United States, there were two factors involved in it. Um, one had to do with Jewish survival uh, and whether or not we could co create a class of non-reducible Jewish identities through day school education. And the other actually was a 
um, an alternative to newly segregated schools, particularly in the South, where Jewish families would elect to send their kids to a Jewish school uh, instead of to an integrated school, claiming, of course, that they, they were going for um, superior education and looking at uh, college entrance and, and things of that uh, nature. With respect to longitudinal Jewish identity, the evidence is pretty clear that the summer camps are more effective than the school programs, that um, day schools are more effective than, um, day schools are more effective than supplemental schools, camps are more effective than that. And then as a backstop to all of it, and it's just lost a tremendous amount of funding, plus all of the problems we have today, has been the impact of um, Birthright, which was originally designed as an anti-mixed marriage program, but uh, I think has had other uh, other positive consequences for the for the Jewish community. So it we have a variety of institutions that are creating stronger Jewish identities, um, giving the basis for Jewish leadership, interest in Jewish leadership in their adult lives and it, it's it's really a collection of them and not any one in specific i i just read there's a tikva the tikva foundation may be launching a new school themselves uh in uh, in new york uh and what that speaks to is the nature of philanthropy in the united states it's education is very very expensive and one of the things that the current dominant generation or generations can do is create um, a, uh, a financial basis for there to be Jewish institutions in the future. Uh, we have, we're being hit by all types of negative trends. Um, joining in general in American society is down. And when there's the famous work Bowling Alone by Putnam, uh, and then uh, not only are fewer people joining, but when they join, they join for shorter amounts of time. So in my parents' generation, if you joined the synagogue, you joined it early in life as a young married, and you just stayed to the grave. Uh, and then that has continued to shrink. Now people are coming in for bar bat mitzvahs as late as third grade, fifth grade even, and they're out the door. You know, in my synagogue, I used to call them Malenu Jews because, you know, we'd have the bar mitzvah, the bat mitzvah. I'd announce Elenu, which meant there was seven minutes to go in the service. And they were heading to the door, and that's the last prayer they were going to hear. So I called them Elena Jews. Okay, well, this has really been fascinating. And um, if there are any final words you want to leave with us, that would be great. Otherwise, I will turn this back to Jerry and also uh, encourage people to reach out to uh, Rabbi Sussman. And uh, do look at his book, which is really fascinating, Portrait of an American Rabbi in His Own Words. Thank you, Mindy. And thank you, everybody, for giving me so much time this evening. Thank, Jer thank you, uh, Ra Rabbi Dr. Sussman. Uh, it was an amazing education for me. And I, I, you know, I, I know that you said you could not understand how your own children were doing things. And I can uh, say something like that myself. I'm going to recommend to my three daughters that they watch the recording because they're, they're all, they're religious in different, different ways. And when, you know, my daughter in Israel is Orthodox and, you know, but it, it it's very interesting what, what you were saying. And by the way, talking about, uh, what you're called at the university, we're we're, we're involved with um, this rabbi in Richmond, uh, Shlomo Pira, and, Pira, and he, he's he's originally Portuguese, and he's he's a tenured professor at William and Mary, but at William and Mary he doesn't go by Shlomo, he goes by his his Portuguese name, and I call him Reb Shlomo. That I don't. Call him doctor. I call him Reb Shlomo. He has a PhD from Stanford. But you know, so who knows what all these things have. The other question, the other point about your, you know, you're saying where's where are things going? Chabad seems to be almost the inter, the in between 
they're, they're, yeah, they're Hasidic, but they're, they're different from most Hasidim. And the question that I've talked about with my daughters, where does Chabad go? I mean, all these Chabad missionaries basically go to all kinds of places, but there are, how many places are there? If you have seven or eight kids, where do they go? Anyway, thank you very much. <laughs> I see a whole bunch of new questions popped in, or at least I became available to me on chat, and I apologize for not getting to them. There's some really good questions, and it should give you food for thought for your, your group in the future. They're very important questions. I'm sorry that I didn't see them until the very, very end. Well, um, as I should have said in the beginning, um, after the recording is posted on YouTube, I'll send an email to everyone. Uh, with the link to the recording, but I'll probably also include the chat because there's so much, in, so so many interesting things. Great, and I'm I'm going to review the chat questions for my own benefit and and how I would formulate answers. If you want to send them to me, I'll I can, you know, distribute uh, to okay. people registered. Uh, it's up to you, of course. Um, okay. Anyway, this is our last class of 2023. Um, we will have classes in January. The only class that's really scheduled right now is that for the last last Wednesday in January, we'll have a talk about the uh, Jewish aspects of Jack Ruby's uh, personality and what he did. Um, but we're also going to probably have a introduction to uh, Kabbalah and these other classes that we're in development right now. So everybody have a good uh, new year. And uh, we'll see you back in January. And thank you again, uh, Rabbi Dr. Sus Sussman and Mindy for the great questions that you came up with. Rav Todot, Rabbi Dr. Sussman, also known as Lance. Yeah. And uh, I hope our paths cross again very soon. Thank you. Todot. Okay. Bye-bye, everyone.